Hi everybody, this is Mr. Folly, and as I looked before, whoa, that's kind of crazy, um, this podcast last year took 17 minutes, so hopefully I can get this into one, so don't be surprised if you got to go to two, or you're probably going back to another one. So, effects of intermolecular forces, which we talked about today, vapor pressure, which we barely talked about, um, looking at the graphs of evaporation, and water is wonderful due to hydrogen bonds. So, let's quickly run through this. State of matter is due to intermolecular and some intramolecular forces. Um, the only intramolecular force that um, affects state of matter is network covalent, well, ionic lattices are the intramolecular ones, and covalent lattices are intramolecular as well. Stronger forces are more likely to make you solid, not that they make you solid, but uh, you're more likely to be solid or occasionally liquid. Weakest forces make you a gas. Ionic lattices make solids. Ionic bonds, remember, are intra, and they are strong. Um, and we talked about them being strong. However, covalent lattices are actually the strongest. And they would have the highest melting and boiling points. And they're typically networks of carbon, like diamond, or quartz and sand, which is SiO2, um, for us. Other carbons and silicon compounds are possible, and usually it'll indicate that from there um, in the question. Explain these. Fluorine is a gas. Bromine is a liquid. It's a solid at room temperature. Now realize fluorine is going to be F2. Bromine is going to be Br2. And iodine is going to be I2. So this would mean that fluorine would have the weakest, and iodine would have the strongest. So if we have diatomic molecules, what type of interaction does that have? Well, if it's a molecule, it's going to have an intermolecular force, and those forces are going to be London dispersion forces for all of them. Now, which one would have the biggest London dispersion force? The one with the most electrons. And since iodine has way more electrons, it has way better London dispersion forces, and that's why it's a solid. Bromine's in the middle, liquid, fluorine is a gas. And this just shows some of the other ones that go through it. So, um, just to show you, this would be London dispersion forces. This is dipole, dipole. This is dipole, dipole. This is dipole, dipole. This is dipole, dipole. This is H bond. This would be ionic, which should be a huge jump, and this would be ionic. So you can see some of the changes as those happen. So there should be a pretty substantial, and there is, between London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole. And then it keeps creeping up. And the iodine one is big, is better dipole-dipole. And remember, everything is also London dispersion forces, so I should also add that on here. So if you have two that are the same, the tiebreaker is London dispersion forces. So all of those dipole-dipole things, the tiebreaker is London dispersion forces, um, for which one is uh, more attractive. As intermolecular forces increase, what happens to each of the following, and why? The why is they are more attracted to each other, so they stick together more. So if you stick together more, that means your boiling point is going to go up. Um, boiling point is going from a liquid to a solid. Viscosity is resistance to flow. So, for example... Honey has a bigger viscosity than, say, gasoline. It flows more. It resists flow more, so it'll flow slower. So if intermolecular forces increase, your resistance to flow increases because it'll stick together more. Surface tension, it'll stick together more. You'll have better surface tension. Enthalpy of fusion is the energy it takes to melt. And the energy it takes to melt it would increase because it would want to be a solid for longer. Your freezing point would... Um, increase because you're going to be a solid for longer because you're going to stick together more so you will be a solid for longer and vapor pressure is something we talked about I think in only one class today vapor pressure is the pressure of an evaporated gas back on the liquid and I'm going to talk about vapor pressure a lot more here in a minute um, and it's got to be in a sealed container but the weaker the for or the stronger the forces, the less gas you're going to have. So that means the less pressure you're going to have. So vapor pressure is going to go down. Um, heat of vaporization would go up. The energy takes to boil it because it's going to want to stay liquid more. 
Um, things have different attractions for different things. This is figure 10-7 from your book. Non-polled liquid forms a convex meniscus in a glass tube, which is kind of odd. Um, water forms a concave meniscus in adhesion versus cohesion. Um, if something is um, adhesive, like a Band-Aid is an adhesive, um, an adhesive sticks to something else, and cohesion is sticking to itself. So in this case, the mercury is more attracted to itself than it is to the glass. So if I had, like water, for example, this water molecule would be attracted to the side because it has better adhesive properties. So it would form the meniscus we're used to seeing for water. Beads of water in a waxed, on a waxed car finish. Um, the beads of water happen, let me get back to a better color, Beads of water happen because if I have these particles and they're not very attracted to each other, gravity flattens them out. But if I had another one here, gravity would flatten it out unless it's attracted to these guys. And I had another one here, it's going to be attracted to these guys, and another one here, it'll be so attracted to this. But if they're not very attracted, gravity will pull it down and it will be one layer. So the bigger the beads, the more, um, the stronger the inter, or in, yeah stronger the intermolecular forces. So better beads means stronger force or stronger attraction. Now let's look at vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is force evaporated gas back down the original liquid. Notice we need a lid on it. If it doesn't have a lid, the gas just goes away. So first there's evaporation. And then once there's evaporation, the gases exert a pressure back down. Now, the more this thing evaporates, the stronger the pressure. So, for example, gasoline, which evaporates quickly, would have a high vapor pressure, whereas motor oil, which barely evaporates, would have a low vapor pressure. And another way this is often shown is um, using manometers like this is a manometer. I'm using an old-fashioned barometer with this. So figure 1040A and B, measuring the vapor pressure of a liquid. So looking at this, these things are fairly consistent, but what the ones that have more gas in it, the ones that have more gas in it have a higher, more gas equals more vapor pressure because it will evaporate more. So these guys would have a greater vapor pressure. And vapor pressure, as you can imagine, is related to the temperature. So here's the vapor pressure on the y-axis, and here's the temperature on the x. Excuse me, I'm going to... Hopefully my cough button worked. So as the temperature goes up, then the vapor pressure also goes up, because the hotter something is, then it will um, turn to gas more. Notice there's not a vapor pressure once you get to boiling, because boiling is not the same thing as vapor pressure. Well, actually, it is. Vapor pressure is the force exerted by an evaporated gas in the remaining liquid. If strong intermolecular forces, vapor pressure is high. Oops, sorry. Vapor pressure is, really sorry about that, low, because particles will have such strong attractions they will remain liquido. Question. You are given the following out of water, methanol, ethanol, diethyl ether. Eth so what you want to do is look at the different types of intermolecular forces you have here. You have an H bond here, and you have an H bond here, and you have an H bond here, and this is not hydrogen bonded, but it does have an oxygen. Uh, oh, that's supposed to be a CH2, so di diethyl ether, that's a typo. Um, and that's an ether, so it has a barely a dipole, but it has a dipole. And then ethylene glycol has two H bonds, okay? So which would you expect to have the highest vapor pressure? Now, they were nice and gave us all of this. The one with the highest vapor pressure would be the one with the lowest um, boiling point, which would make sense because dipole-dipole is the weakest one that we talked about. So the one we'd expect to have the highest vapor pressure would be diethyl ether. The one we'd expect with the lowest vapor pressure would be ethylene glycol because it has two areas of super attraction. Plus, boiling point numbers are actually easier, but I'm trying to get you to analyze the fun, fun, fun world of organic stuff. Vapor pressure in boiling, when vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure, the substance is boiling. Boiling. That is a definition that is very difficult to understand, and you don't have to. You just have to regurgitate it from time to time. Sorry about that, but uh, regurgitate. Evaporation is not boiling. In order to boil, I'm sorry, that's boiling point. In order to boil, 
Boiling happens throughout the whole thing. Evaporation um, happens only at the top. Um, a boiling point boiling only happens at the boiling point. Evaporation happens at any temperature or at lower temperatures. Um, I thought there was something else I'm forgetting. Boy, this is bad. This is what happens when you forget your computer at home. I can't remember the other parts. Oh, well. There's one other part, and I can't think of the difference. Oh, well. If you can look it up in the book, we're in Chapter 10. That would be extra credit for you, because I'm doing this on a Friday. Temperature effects evaporation. So this is our Boltzmann curve for temperature. I keep telling that to you, so if you're ever asked to do one. Um, notice here, these graphs are supposed to be the same. The hotter it is, remember, you have a lower T, lower peak, but it's shifted to the right a little bit. And the area under the curve right here is larger. So temperature affects evaporation. The hotter it is, the more it evaporates. Big surprise, because of equilibrium of liquid and gases. Every point is at equilibrium. Freezing, melting, boiling, condensing, sublimi subliming, and deposition. Um, vapor pressure is also an equilibrium. Vapor pressure is an equilibrium system, too. That means when a particle freezes, another particle melts. Blah, 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 blah. The reason why at the freezing point something, or the melting point, something will melt is because if I have ice and I get it to the melting point, it will melt because I keep adding heat to it. I think I have my crazy question coming up now. Water has magical properties due to hydrogen bonding. It beads up. Why? It has high surface tension. Why? Because it is so attracted to itself. It regulates temperature in living things. Why? It has um, a high specific heat. So a lot of things are made out of water. That means we don't change temperature very much. If we change temperature as quickly as, say, cement, we would die because we wouldn't be able to handle really, really, really hot stuff for living things. And that's because it's polar, and most things that you want to dissolve are polar. Um, lake effect is, again, high specific heat. Specific heat symbol is C, if you remember. Specific heat is ability or the energy it takes to change one gram, one degree Celsius. So because we have the giant... Um, Lake Michigan next to us. Lake Michigan acts as a big insulator. So it's always, I'm going to say, like three months behind um, on temperatures. So if you have, like right now it's December, so its temperatures are really like October's. So the air outside today was 27 degrees. The lake's temperature was 40 degrees. So if you're closer to the lake, the temperature by the lake, although where we were is 27, it might be something like 36 degrees. In the summertime, when the air outside is 100 degrees, the lake is still three months behind, so the lake might be 75 degrees. So if you're on land by the lake, the temperature might be 81 degrees, which is why people want to live by the lake. It's warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. Um, three states of matter for a low molar mass. So meaning that you see both a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Thank goodness it can be a gas, it can evaporate. Thank goodness it can be a liquid and rain and give us water to drink. Thank goodness it can freeze um, when it does because then it'll freeze on top, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ice forms loops, so ice floats. Um, the reason these loops, that increases the volume. So ice floats and, whoops, I'm trying to insert a blank slide here. And quickly, I only have a minute. Um, I won't be able to do my review thing. But if I have a little fish, and my little fish, the lake freezes from the top, and all of this sank, it would crush my little fish, and I had my little dead fish down here, and everything, whoops, everything would be at the bottom of the lake would be frozen, and that would be bad. But because ice forms ring, and it's less dense than water, then that doesn't happen. So if ice was more dense than water, um, it would sink and kill everything. Review, intermolecular forces affect a bunch of different things, but it usually just makes them clump, and that's the explanation, but don't use the word clump. It's kind of dumb. Evaporation is not equal boiling. Vapor pressure is equilibrium and higher for weakly attracted forces. When vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure, that is sublimation too, but it's also boiling. And I think I made it just in time to get out of here. Sorry I went so quickly on that. Have a wonderful weekend. Toodle.